fun. I promised a minute, I gave, I gave a minute. Um, all right, welcome everybody, good afternoon. Uh, I guess, uh, well, welcome to the March 2022 meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, so last month, I think as you guys all know, uh, we, we canceled our meeting, but uh, after a month off, uh, we have a pretty robust agenda uh, for, for our March meeting. Uh, lots to catch up on, so we, I guess we might as well just get into it. So I think uh, with, with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, please join me in reciting uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Janeth, I don't know if you can put the flag up to make it official, but... Uh, yeah, I am totally trying, <laughs> trying to put it up. Yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, no, that's I, I okay. Just, Let me see if... Gotcha um, if this, here. Yep, there it is. Good. All right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> all right, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America and to the republic, the republic for which it stands, stand. one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Sure. Great, thanks everybody. Okay, so we will go to the next uh, the next item here, which is the roll call. Uh, Jan, can we have a roll call? Call, please. No problem. Um, Commissioner Okello. Present. Commissioner Merrilies. Present. You're muted. Commissioner Mane. Present. Uh, Commissioner Green is absent. And Chair Laguna. Here. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, okay, so so now now we're going to start getting into into the third item, which is the resolution author, authorizing the virtual commission meeting. So as we've been doing the last couple of months, every meeting we're going to have to adopt a resolution to continue meeting virtually. So uh, following the signing of AB 361 uh, in September, uh, we'll have to recertify every month that there's a continuing state of emergency uh, in order to continue to meet virtually. So. I'm now going to, I believe I have to put this up for, for public comment as well. So I'm going to put it up for public comment uh, prior to uh, adopting that resolution to continue meeting in person. So uh, is, is there any public comment uh, on this item? I do have one hand raised for public comment. Um, his sure. name is Jerry, oh, Jeffrey, I think Flynn. Flynn. Um, so go ahead and go ahead and I'm going to, you might can begin speaking on that item. One second. Go ahead. Um, can, hi, this is Jeff. Um, can hi. I make a general public comment, and not particular to anything on your agenda? So, yes, yeah. So this is this is on item on item three. Uh, yeah. Item four is public comment for items okay. not listed. Okay, on I had my hand raised before the meeting started. Should I lower my hand? <laughs> Don't worry, you'll you'll be up next. We'll we'll, we'll get okay. you after after. Okay. 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 So <laughs> otherwise, then yes, no, there is uh, nothing for that item then. Great. Okay. So uh, I, I move to adopt a resolution authorizing the Parks Commission to meet virtually in March, uh, given the continuing risks of, uh, of meeting in person. Uh, do I have a second? Yes. Second. Okay. Great. Uh, Janet, can I have a roll call, please? I do have some discussion. I do have some. Oh, oh sorry. 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 Should I open up the discussion? Right. Um, and it comes out of something that I learned this morning. Uh, from, you know, from the training. And that is uh, 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 that, uh, you know, we have the ability to influence legislation. And so uh, I would like to suggest that we have a discussion and uh, recommend to the Board of Supervisors, you know, that uh, they could advocate for making Zoom meetings permanent. And uh, I have basically two arguments. One, and uh, staff could help us certainly verify this, not only from our perspective, but from the, all the, the perspective of all the other commissions in the county. I think there has been greater participation from the public uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in all of the meetings. I may be wrong, but I get a sense that there has been. There have been a lot more people attending our meetings as a result of it being in Zoom on Zoom. And then secondly, we can also advance a, a health and an environmental argument. You know, having people drive whatever distance, and San Mateo County is a fairly large county. And so having people drive from South Francisco, I mean, South San Francisco, you know, to attend a meeting of any one of those commissions is certainly not good for the environment. You know, and having commissioners themselves drive 
all the hundred and over a hundred commissioners constantly driving from their home or their place of work is certainly not uh, good for the environment. So I would like to suggest that, uh, yes, let's go ahead and adopt this resolution, but uh, uh, figure out a way to initiate some discussion of all commissions with the hope that we can persuade the Board of Supervisors do whatever is necessary to make sure that we can make this uh, a permanent feature of uh, public discourse. So, so Comm Commissioner Kellett, do, do, you, do you think we should put it for a future uh, agenda item, like maybe maybe in next month to start to get to get together? Because uh, I, I I feel like uh, as as it stands right now with um, with uh, the Omicron fading a little bit. Um, they're probably, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe, there, maybe there's, some, there's some movement at the county to start to think about how we would move back to in-person meetings. So I do think that we probably should uh, get our point of view or alignment around uh, what it is that we're thinking about, even post kind of everyone starting to come back. I agree with you. We can put it in next meeting's agenda since um, okay. what's on the agenda is just adopt this resolution. We can adopt the resolution, but put it yeah. in the future agenda to start discussion about its permanency. Got it, makes sense. Great, excellent. Any other uh, discussion on, uh, on, this, on this resolution? Okay, then uh, let's, uh, let's, let's take it to a roll call then. Uh, okay, so Commissioner Okello? Yes. Commissioner Merrilees? Yes. Commissioner Manning? Yes. Commissioner yes. Uh, yes. Chair Laguna. Chair Laguna. Uh, yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Great. All right. So now, now we're going to move on to public comments. So item four, uh, we're going to provide the general public with an opportunity to, to comment on items that are not tied to our agenda. Uh, welcome all. All public comments. Uh, please note that since these items are not on the agenda, they're not they're not up for discussion. So we're we're just going to take take these uh, the, these items as they come. Um, and I think Janet, now is the time that you uh, you read the uh, the rules, uh, the public participation instructions for the audience. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for those attending the meeting on the Zoom video conference, we'll be using the raised hand feature in order to organize any public comments. During the raised, um, during the general public comments and um, on each item on the agenda, regular agenda, I'll be asking those members of the public who wish to comment to click the raised hand feature uh, to raise your hand to speak on the agenda item. For those um, joining by phone, please press star nine to indicate your desire to speak. Please note that members of the public must wait for my prompt to, uh, in connection with each agenda item before using the raised hand function. For example, you cannot raise your hand for at the beginning of the item for something that is later in the item um, or the agenda. When you hear your name called, please uh, mute your mic. We've been speaking at that time. So right now I do not see, let me just double check one more time. Actually I do. I do see a few hands raised for, for this item. Let's see. Um, Before we open it up, would I, uh, do we have the youth commissioner present? And should we acknowledge um, um, his um, presence? Um, Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I think we should acknowledge that uh, the youth commissioner is present. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. So then, um, welcome. So then we do have um, Jeffrey Finn. Please unmute your microphone and begin speaking. You will have two minutes. So let's see. Let me know if you Hi. Yeah. Right. Hi. My name's Jeff. I'm uh, representing the San Francisco Board Selling Association. I just wanted to let you know that we're out there to uh, help you in anything related to recreational water access in the Bay. Um, we've uh, helped uh, the National Park Service and the Bay Water Trail with ABAG MTC on their analysis of uh, water trail issues, uh, mapping and uses and um, we're about um, improving recreational water access in the Bay. And we've um, facilitated arranging money from developers to like pay the Army Corps of Engineers to remove submerged pilings 
off of Coyote Point and similar endeavorments. Um, so I just wanted to um, introduce us as the San Francisco Port Sailing Association. We've been in existence since 1986. And um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much for your comment. I will next call on Carlisle Ann Young. Please unmute your microphone and begin speaking. Let me go ahead and reset that timer. Um, go ahead, let me know. Hi, thank you. You can hear me, right? Yes, I can. go ahead. Um, first of all, I had my hand up for that last agenda item when you said, were there any more comments, but you didn't see it. Um, so I'll just briefly mention that if you do go to, um, back to in-person meetings, you might consider doing a hybrid model like the Mid-Coast Community Council is doing. They haven't started going back into, um, you know, group meetings yet, but, um, or in-person meetings. However, they, um, they did say that they're planning to have one where you could join from home because I live way over on the coast and it wouldn't be that convenient to come to Redwood City to attend these meetings. So I just wanted to mention that. And the other reason I was calling is because I think it was at the last Mid Coast Community Council meeting, they voted to turn down. And then after that, the um, Planning Commission voted to turn down the off lead leash dog pilot program that while I don't have a dog, many people did speak up about the fact that there were no off leash dog areas located within San Mateo County. So it might be something the parks district would want to address. I know I think Pillar Point Bluff people do walk up there off leash from way back when Dave Holland was the parks director because he said that it was originally historically an off leash area. But, you know, since then the Golden Gate National Recreation Area took over Montero Mountain and they don't let people walk their dogs off leash up there anymore. And a lot of the dog owners really do want people to, um, <coughs> sorry, their dogs be off leash in county areas so you might want to think about it that's all i really had to say and um I'll, I'll see if there's any other items i want to weigh in on but thank you for um looking into maybe having a hybrid type of a meeting virtual and public meeting okay thank you thank you ms young cover my coughing spell here in the middle of your comment but um i think uh Chair Laguna, I think that's the last speaker we have for, for, um, for this, so go ahead. Okay, great. All right, so, uh, so here we go from, uh, from public comment to action to set the agenda. Uh, so uh, would someone like to make a motion to set the agenda? I'll make the motion. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second it. Great. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Okello. Aye. Commissioner Merrilees. Aye. Commissioner Mene? Aye. Per Laguna? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Fantastic. Moving right along here. Okay. So uh, so now we're on to uh, item six, which is the Parks Foundation Executive Director's Report. I think we have Michelle. Hello. Did you get her? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, uh, park staff, and guests. Uh, I just had three updates to share with you. Um, one is at our, I think it was the February board meeting, um, the Parks Foundation Board agreed to fund uh, trail rides for youth at Wonderlick County Park in partnership with the Mounted Patrol Foundation and the Sheriff's Activity League. Um, we had an opportunity to go out and see it with our own eyes last Friday. Um, and so it, it seems like a really wonderful opportunity for teens to get an opportunity to learn about grooming and saddling and having a lesson in the arena and then going for a trail ride. Um, another thing that we funded, I guess, last year that has now been um, installed are new shade shelters at Coyote Point. So we were happy to um, be a, um, to provide matching funds for that project. And then the final thing I will mention is we're really happy to um, be receiving a California Coastal Commission whale tail grant, um, which will support educational tours to Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. Um, so I will be learning more about that next week, but I'm um, looking forward to working with San Mateo County Parks and the Friends of Fitzgerald Marine Reserve and others to um, do some good stuff there. So that's my update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. 
Fantastic. Yeah, let's let's open it up to questions from the commission uh, first, and then we'll we'll do public comment second. Okay, I, I have a question um, with the with the horse patrol project. Um, how many kids got to do that? Um, I, I think it's a different group every time. It's once a month, and so on Friday there were I think seven teams that got to be a part of it. So they come through the sheriff's activities league. Very cool. Uh, so, um, so the sheriff's uh, 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 the sheriff's activity league uh, primarily focuses on on kids that uh, live in unincorporated areas, and that's their service area. And so, the question then is: uh, to, what, to what extent uh, is there tracking uh, to make sure that the kids from the whole entire county? can participate in the program. I think that is good feedback, uh, Commissioner Okello, and I don't have an answer, so why don't I go ahead and see how expansive this program is or could become? Okay, thank you. Great. Um, any other questions or comments from the, from the commissioners before we open it up for public comment? All right, so we'll we'll uh, we'll open it up for uh, for public comment. Anyone have any uh, any statements uh, uh, based on this uh, this item six, the uh, Park Foundation Executive Director report? So public comment for um, this item is uh, we have one hand raised for public comment. We have Carla and Young. So let me see, Ms. Young. I'm gonna go ahead and put my timer up, and then I'll go ahead and unmute your microphone. Um, give me one second while I put that up for you. I think I accidentally already unmuted. There you go. It's okay. <laughs> go ahead. Um, does uh, Michelle have any um, reports on what kind of um, programs they're going to be offering at the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve for that uh, whale tail money? She didn't mention anything specifically. I, uh, you know, we well, it's going to be field trips, and um, also we're probably going to try and do some uh, translation. Um, and just creating some new materials. So we have a couple of things that we're able to do with the funding and I'm happy to come back and report on it as we do it. Oh, okay. Um, I was just gonna mention that that SAL program, they do um, help the kids at Pillar Ridge. That's not you, that was the other commissioner, Okello. But um, I don't know, there was an article in the San Mateo County Times about the, um, uh, embezzlement that happened. So I don't know how much money they have to expand to the whole entire county, but I do know the Sheriff's Activity League does um, offer some some things on, those. it's not expansive. We don't have any kind of a meeting place like a community center or anything like that. So before you expand it out to the whole county, maybe see how much money they fund. There may not be as much money as you think. Oh, thank you. Thanks for your comment. Um, let's see. I think uh, actually, uh, Chair, we're all done for public comment on this item. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so we will shift gears now into the park director's report. Uh, Commissioner Calderon? Uh, yeah. Let me go ahead and uh, have a, just a couple did slides I call you here. Commissioner, director. You, you did. I, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to. I. You know. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Chair Laguna, it, I can only imagine it's probably one of those days. So, yeah, no worries. I'll I'll uh, go ahead and, and throw this up on uh, on uh, on the screen here. Give me one second. Can you see the presentation? Beautiful. Uh, so just a couple updates. So uh, earlier, uh, early last week, we opened our bids for the Quarry Park Pump Track project and uh, identified uh, American Ramp Company as the um, low bid. And so we will be going to the Board of Supervisors on March 22nd to 
uh, to award that contract. The, the plan right now is actually to start construction instead of February, it'll be uh, March. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we'll award the contract in March, not February. We will still start construction in May and it's anticipated to be a 60 day construction window. So we will still be opening this summer uh, which is awesome because it gives uh, all the kids on the coast side something to do during summer break uh, that's new, exciting, and really cannot be more excited to get this uh, to get this facility open. Every time I go out to the coast, people are asking about it. So I think this is a huge uh, uh, a huge step in, in the direction that we are going to, at providing new uh, and desired uh, services and amenities. So really excited to get this going. Uh, of note, the uh, project is being funded through a variety of sources. Uh, Michelle and the foundation uh, received grant funding that will help fund this. Uh, they uh, were able to receive a, a handful of sizable uh, amount in donations. The, um, the Coastside Mountain Bikers were contributing to those donations. The Granada Community Services District contributed $100,000 to construction, and then the Mid-Coast Park and Rec Development Fund will uh, cover the rest. So uh, this really is uh, just a great example of um, the types of projects we're excited to pursue and, and really a great example of how that money is supposed to be used. So really excited. Next, uh, if you've been to Memorial Park, you have seen this in real life. And uh, these are the facilities that uh, our campers were using for many years at Memorial Park. We replaced uh, seven restrooms and shower buildings in 2020. And we are now replacing the remaining six that are in the, um, that need to be replaced that are in the day use and picnic areas. So these are what the new facilities look like that are already up and running. These new pictures are in Memorial. This is what the new facilities look like. Uh, and we have already demoed the old ones. The foundations have been poured for the new ones and construction is underway and on schedule. We um, are looking like uh, we're going to be on budget and possibly even a little under budget. Uh, right now we have a budget of $4.2 million for, excuse me, this project. And uh, we received so many compliments from campers uh, last year who got to experience the new facilities and uh, really can't wait for uh, everyone to have access to these new facilities. Something that I thought was really interesting, we surveyed Memorial Park campers last year and 25% of campers at Memorial Park were new to Memorial. That is a big number for new campers. Um, and so being able to provide them with the highest quality of experience is what's going to uh, change them from being first timers to returning and repeat uh, visitors to Memorial. So really excited about that. Flood Park is another great project we have going on. We held our first workshop in February. Uh, it was attended by approximately 80, uh, 85 people. And uh, we held breakout sessions and that allowed us to hear from uh, individuals who were focused on different aspects of the park. So the four uh, breakout sessions included uh, urban forestry, uh, sports fields and, and play amenities. We had picnic and reservation sites. And then we had a breakout session uh, dedicated to Spanish speakers. So, uh, so really making sure that we are opening the process to as many people as possible. In addition to that workshop, we are gonna be holding two pop-up events as well as opening online surveys. So if you were unable to make the workshop or that's just not how you wanna provide your feedback, you're gonna be able to participate in the pop-up events or fill out online surveys. First pop-up event is gonna be scheduled for um, the 12th of this month. And that's gonna be at uh, Casa Circulo in North Fair Oaks on Middlefield Road. And then the second pop-up event at this point is looking like it's actually gonna be a movie in the park. So we're going to host a movie at Flood Park and we'll be able to talk with uh, participants about the project and solicit their feedback and then they get to watch an awesome movie. So uh, really, really excited about that. Uh, one of, the of What is the date of the second one? Uh, that's still TBD. Okay. So we're still locking that down. Um, 
And once we have that, we'll certainly share that information with the public. Thank you. Of course. So one of the things that this commission has heard me talk about is deferred maintenance. And, and anyone who has been working with the department for a while knows that we have a lot of deferred maintenance uh, that we have to catch up on. And uh, a, a big chunk of that is our paving. And so for, for some years now, we've been repaving parking lots and drive aisles and, and, uh, and, and we're working on trail surfaces. And so uh, this upcoming year, one of the uh, big paving projects we're gonna do is we're gonna pave three miles of Sawyer Camp Trail. So the, that's gonna be the Northern three miles. The Southern three miles was paved, um, uh, I believe within the last 10 years or so. And, uh, and that section is in, in fairly good condition, but this Northern three section really needs to be paved and, and it'll provide a, a whole different experience for individuals on bikes or rollerblades or um, even just walking. And so really excited to address that deferred maintenance and but provide that higher quality experience uh, as well. And so uh, we'll be working with our partners at Public Works on this project, uh, still working on a schedule. We'll have to work through some issues around culverts uh, and to do this project, the trail will likely have to be closed for somewhere between three to four weeks. Uh, but I truly think closing down uh, amenities for that extended period of time and doing that project really in, in the most comprehensive way you can provides not only the best opportunity for the department to do a project right, but it also provides the best experience for the visitors after. Uh, Tunisia's Creek Beach, we have submitted our coastal development permit and we'll be going to the uh, planning commission within the next six months to secure our coastal development permit so we can break ground on construction. Uh, right now, we are anticipating construct. Uh, the project will open in summer or uh, fall of 2023. So still on the approximate schedule we've kind of set years ago. Uh, here's kind of an illustration of what that property will look like at different stages. So the photo on the left is at the top by Highway 1, and that photo on the right will be where the existing house is. And, uh, and I've, you've heard me talk about in the past how each level of the property is gonna provide its own experience for, uh, for the visitors. And that really is just such a special, uh, a special aspect to this park that I really don't think uh, people are gonna be, be able to find anywhere else. So um, really excited to get this project uh, going this property open and, and accessible for the public again, or accessible for the public. Uh, Corey Park Master Plan. So we've been working to uh, clean this document up and get it ready for public review and consumption. So this was a, a document that we wanted to go out to the public uh, with in summer of 2020. And obviously all things considered, it got uh, shelved for a little bit and we're ready to pick that up and get it going again. So uh, we did an internal review the other day. Our plan at this point is to go to the public in April. That will include a meeting at the Midcoast Community Council. We'll solicit feedback from the public, make the necessary adjustments, and then uh, we'll bring this forward to the commission as well as the Board of Supervisors, uh, and uh, we'll have this plan adopted. And one of the unique aspects of how this, this master plan kind of proceeded was we've already started implementing a lot of the recommendations out of it, uh, which is not typical, but um, under the circumstances, things like pump tracks, fuel reduction, that was all part of the master plan and, and we've gotten an early start on that. Uh, earlier, you heard a member of the public talk about the off-leash dog recreation pilot program. So that is correct. Uh, the planning commission denied the coastal development permit that would allow the pilot program to occur. Uh, the commission will recall that the recommendation for the pilot program was to pilot it at Pillar Point Bluff and at Quarry Park. Uh, the department uh, elected to amend its request. And so we appealed the planning commission's decision to the board of supervisors, but it will only be for the pilot program to occur at Quarry Park. So, um, so that, that was appealed uh, already. Uh, we will likely go to the Board of Supervisors in April and uh, see what the board has to say about whether this pilot program is consistent with the local coastal program. Uh, so again, that will happen in uh, April sometime. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions the commission may have. 
Great. Well, yeah, let's let's open it up to commissioner comments and questions. I got a couple, but let's uh, let's let the other commissioners uh, go first. Any of the commissioners have uh, comments or questions for uh, for Director Calderon? Uh, uh, not so much questions, but uh, just uh, you know some quick comments. Mm -hmm. I did try to attend the flood park uh, uh, renovation, the first workshop. You know, but I couldn't uh, stay for the entire time because of uh, internet issues. You know, but uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the two pop-up events that uh, you know you have mentioned because, uh, you know, at a ground level, it would be very nice to see just the department, as well as the commissioners, certainly work. I mean, talk to residents or talk to attendees, and you know, get their perspectives on uh, on the plans that we do have. That's all. Great. Uh, Commissioner Mann and Commissioner Merrilees. Yeah, just all, all those things look great, Nicholas. I was I was disappointed that the um, that the dog policy didn't pass. Um, but um, yeah, thanks for pushing it forward. Um, um, we'll see how again. Uh, thank uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and uh, Nick, great job as always. I think um, as we try to come to a close and, and, and potentially, uh, you know, open the floodgates, which I, I don't know, uh, each entity has uh, their ruling. State of California may open the floodgates, schools and different district, but I mean, uh, me and the airport, I mean, we, still have to wear our masks and still have to be real cautious. I don't know what um, parks as a uh, county uh, administration is uh, falling under what protocol the, the state has asked them to do once they initially uh, open their doors to everyone. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, we're going to be expecting in the months to come, but I mean, as always, great job uh, putting this together. And, you know, I don't know what, I'm, I'm sure you get briefings, uh, you know, daily or maybe, uh, you know, uh, on the hour, maybe on the day to, to what, what we've uh, learned from the two years and in the year three and, and what, what could we possibly be looking at in the summer months or in the maybe activities that we might, we might have. I, yeah, hey, Commissioner Manet, I, you know, I certainly suspect, yeah, I'll just provide the commission with an overall update, which is that the county uh, health officer and the county manager and the board of supervisors have all determined that the county will follow the state's uh, lead on this. So when the state changes their process, the count or the their requirements, the county does the same. They made that determination early on in the pandemic. Uh, you'll recall everyone was doing something different and it was making it overly complicated. So San Mateo County will typically always follow what the state does. Um, and, and I would imagine that in-person meetings, uh, including Brown Act compliant meetings will uh, go back to in-person fairly soon here. Thank you. Um, anything else, Commissioner Marilise? Did you, did you have any, any no, other no, 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 okay, that Great. All right. So I, I actually had just a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, for, first one on Memorial. Um, so Memorial, obviously, a lot of work's been done. And uh, you know, I know there's been a lot of renovations and whatnot. But um, what's the plan after these these next six bathrooms? Or are we kind of like complete for the, the major renovations? I know there's been a lot of them, right? You know, from the from the water to all these other pieces. But are there more phases to it? Or will that kind of get us to the point where we've kind of modernized it to, uh, to more, uh, I, I guess, today's standards? Chair Laguna, great question. You probably opened up a bigger can of worms than what you were wanting. But I'll, <laughs> I'll try and, and be brief here. So to date, things that have occurred, you mentioned the six restrooms and shower rooms. We've repaved all the parking lots and drive aisles and paths of travel. 
I added an ADA ramp to the ranger station, uh, up modernized the wastewater treatment plant, the water treatment plant, redid the entire wastewater collection system. That's what we've done. What mm -hmm. we still have to do after this phase of the restrooms and shower rooms is uh, modernize the entire water distribution system, which part of that project is actually uh, just recently broke ground and is gonna, uh, we'll be able to provide some more uh, uh, detailed reports on that in the future. We um, are looking at um, some of the underutilized spaces in there in the park to see what makes the most sense uh, with regards to uses there. Uh, Michelle and the foundation uh, are working with the department uh, to look at that main entrance and understand uh, what's the best way to structure that so it's visitor friendly and easy to use and, and understand you know, what direction you're supposed to be going. So there's a lot that is gonna be left to do, but I would say uh, the bulk of it is done. Um, uh, the bulk of it is done, but we will continue to, to tie up some loose ends between now and J uh, July of 2024 when Memorial Park turns 100 years. Yes. Yes, and that, that was actually the, the point of the question. I, wa I wanted to make sure uh, Memorial was looking pretty for, uh, for, the, for the 100th uh, anniversary. So that's, that's great. I, Chair Laguna, I'll tell you, I will turn it over to Superintendent Lombardi, who's worked there and has been with this department far longer than I have. But um, I, I, Scott, I don't know if you, I think Memorial is probably looking better than ever. But what do you think? Oh, yeah, I, I would have to say, Nick, you've just about touched everything. I think the only thing you missed were some power upgrades, I think, mm -hmm. uh, where we're going to for the infrastructure. But uh, it's it's an amazing park. It's it's uh, embracing the public. And I'm so excited where we're going with this. It was so needed. And thanks to the foundation and everybody for helping us out in this situation out there. It's it's going to be amazing. 100 year anniversary is going to be something. It really is going to be. So we keep moving forward. Thanks for the support. Excellent. Great. Um, so two, two other questions. One, um, in terms of some of the repair projects. So you, you, got, you all talked about the, uh, the paving at, uh, at Sawyer Camp. Um, are, are there other priority uh, like paving or infrastructure or deferred maintenance projects that you guys are going to be working on uh, over, over the summer that are going to be of note or, or any, anything else that, uh, that's, that's on tap? So with regard, Chair Laguna, with regards to implementation, uh, we have the water line at Memorial, uh, you know, depending on how the budget finishes with the paving at Sawyer, there may be some more paving that is done. Eastern Promenade will be finished. Uh, I think that's all that are, uh, and the pump track will be finished. Um, I think that's all that will be underway at this point, but uh, probably a larger scale is what is currently being planned and designed, which includes the water distribution system at Coyote Point, the sewer system at Coyote Point, the water distribution system at Hutter Park, a new fire road at Quarry Park, uh, the uh, non-potable water line from the reservoir at Quarry Park. Uh, we have a couple bridge replacements, uh, including one at San Pedro Valley. We have the visitor center at San Pedro Valley. Uh, obviously, Tunitas Creek Beach will be breaking ground, you know, over the next year. Uh, so we have a lot that is tying up, and then we have a lot that uh, is in the design phase that will start uh, construction shortly. And then, of course, you have larger projects like flood that will start probably, you know, two year, you know, maybe a year or two down the road. Got it. Yeah. And, and I know that that was a big portion of kind of your, I guess it was the three year plan. So I just wanted to make sure that we were, we were kind of addressing all of those pieces. And then last one, sorry to monopolize uh, the, the time here, but I did want to know, uh, were there specifics around the denial of the, uh, of, of the, the permit application? Uh, like what, what was there any reasoning that was, that was given behind it? Uh, so and Commissioner Merrilees, I know you've worked on this for many years and you were there. I'm not sure if you want to speak to that. Uh, I, I don't think a specific section of the local coastal program was ever called out, but 
the determination by the planning commission was that the pilot program was not consistent with the county's local coastal program and that's what the not the denial was based on okay great thank you all right so uh as i'm assuming there's no other uh comments from the commissioners uh we'll open uh this one up for public comment as well Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're now opening a public comment for this item, and I do see two hands uh, two hands raised for this item. We have uh, Len Erickson and Carlo and Young. Um, I'm going to do Len Erickson first. Please uh, accept the invitation and unmute your mic and begin speaking. Give me a second for your timer to come up, and then um, give me one second. Right there. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I wanted to uh, compliment your efforts, especially on the coast where you're active with development work in three different sites up and down the, the coast. Um, going in those on the pump track, uh, two questions there. One, uh, really great to see it opening in the summer. Um, it will create a, a, a more, uh, more demand for parking. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity along with your fuel reduction to possibly create more parking space in the land adjoining the uh, the pump track or other provisions you've made to get parking there. Um, on your master plan, uh, I have a question concerning the time frame. I'm assuming that the master plan goes on for 15 or 20 years, really long term. And with respect to wildfire concerns and the eucalyptus, I'm hoping you put things in it that relate to that five to 20 year period. From the community standpoint, we've looked at federal programs and others that may be helpful there, and it would be good to have it represented, those long-term opportunities there. Uh, in terms of off-leash dog, there were specific uh, concerns raised with respect to the vegetation on the bluffs and looking at biological studies. I think some of those can be addressed by studies themselves. I also felt uh, and, and sort of sideline side commented that if you'd restricted the trail just to the Gene Lauer Trail going the full distance of the uh, Pillar Point Bluff, uh, that it, it would have been both more useful and more manageable. So I would hope that as you finish your first year trial, if it's successful in Quarry Park, that you open up that consideration, but simplify the uh, that to, to constrain it. Um, Quarry Park parking overall beyond the pump track is needed. And uh, finally, um, I, I do hope that you will um, really just, um, oh, well, I, I think on the uh, the bluffs, to answer your questions, it was the uh, biological concerns were raised as well. So thanks very much. I'll send this as a note since I covered a lot of territory. Thank you very much, Len. Um, we're next call on Caroline An Young, who accept this invitation and begin speaking, please. Hi, a um, couple things. Um, Nicholas, did you already? Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Can you hear us now? I could hear you, but okay. I, am I muted? No, or go unmuted? ahead. You're good now. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I did tap it and it went away. Um, <laughs> so my question for Nicholas was, is the... Um, uh, the new revised dog pilot program that you're planning to appeal, was that already brought back in front of the Mid-Coast Community Council before you take it to the supervisors? Have you brought it back yet? That's for Nicholas. Are you sure I'm not unmuted? <laughs> no, you're good. I'll yeah. Okay. You. So, yeah, this, this, this is public comment, right? Okay. So, uh, there, All right. Not then I'll just continue on. Yeah. Um, the dog, I think my sense when I went, I didn't listen to the planning commission thing, but the MCC meeting, one of their main um, concerns was that they asked Nicholas during that meeting if there was going to be any more enforcement up on the bluffs and, of course, in Quarry Park. And that's why the MCC turned it down, because his answer was no, they weren't planning or budgeting for any more enforcement for the, anybody who's not going to be doing the off, you know, letting their dogs run too far off leash. So. Um, that was something that if you are going to plan an appeal, you might want to mention that you're going to fund a little more enforcement or you might still get some of the same problems. And then I did attend your um, 
tried to attend the flood park breakout sessions, but I really feel like breakout sessions aren't the way to go. It's more like divide and conquer. And then when you do get into a room, usually only one person gets a chance to speak because you make them kind of short. Um, so that's just a thought there. I'll, I'll see if I can go to your pop-up. I was interested in that. And then as far as the pump track goes, I was listening to the uh, um, Granada Sanitary District meeting, and they are hoping to do some kind or coordinate with you on some kind of a uh, grand opening. But, um, you know, if it's going to open in June or July, that's prime traffic season on the coast. Anyway, you might want to check in with them on that. But um, that, that's really all I had to say. Thanks. Thanks for your Thank comment. You. Uh, we'll now go on to Fran Pollard. Fran, please sit with my and begin speaking. Hold on just one second while I put the timer back on for you. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, my agenda showed a fuel wildfire fuel break. Uh, I thought you were going to talk about that. So are you, Nicholas? I, I just want to say that um yeah I'll actually I'll, I'll go I'll go ahead and answer that one it actually is uh regular agenda item 81 and 82 uh so it should be right now we're only on the parks director report which is item 7 oh okay um well concerning the dog dog uh, off leash dogs um yeah I'm thinking maybe if you made the Quarry Park par uh trails a little bit shorter it looks like they're they can take over the all the trails and i never did get an answer whether those are multiple use trails bikers are going to use the same trails and walkers um i think that's kind of dangerous i think they need to be separated and i think the dog um we really need a dog park somewhere uh, i'm i've suggested um Murata surf east to separate the, the dog walking and dog parks running. Uh, people like to just play with their dogs, throw balls and have them play catch and run around. There's a lot of people that won't, can't climb the hills, don't, don't want to, and they'll just sit or stand and play with their dogs, let them run around. So we really need a place for that. And I think Murata Surf East is a good place to separate the bikers from the dogs, which I think is going to have to be done. Um, cause that's, cause that's where the dog people go to is where, uh, where the pump track is going to go now. So I think that's important. Um, I guess there was something else, but I can't think of it right now. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, actually, let's see, that's our last um, hand raised uh, chair for that item. All right, fantastic. Okay, so we'll, we'll, clo we'll close item seven and, mm -hmm. uh, and roll into our regular agenda. So uh, there's three items on our regular agenda this month, uh, including updates on wildfire management uh, at our parks, as well as uh, preparation for our upcoming uh, Parks Commission retreat. Uh, so I think we'll we'll just get into it, and I believe for item agenda or uh, agenda item uh, eight one, the San Mateo County Parks uh, Department fuel reduction. I believe Hannah, you're going to be you're going to be taking that on. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Fantastic. All right. And Hannah, I, before before you jump in, I know that you're going to be handling part of eight two as well. Uh, I I think, and I'm I'm not sure how how we set it up. Can we? do public comment for each one of the individual items. I'm assuming that's the way that we would do it, right? Yeah, so, so I, I will do public comment for 8-1 and then- um, And then we'll roll into eight. Okay, perfect. I just wanna make sure that, that we're in alignment there. Yes, yeah. Great, thanks, Anna. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, so for my uh, presentation today, um, I'm hoping to provide an update to the commission regarding the Parks Department's uh, wildfire fuel management program. Uh, so the commission has been provided some other updates over time on a variety of our fuel reduction efforts and on the development of our wildfire fuel management program. However, just as a review, the department completed development of our parks-wide wildfire fuel management program in early 2021. 
uh, fuel management or fuel reduction efforts in county parks has been a priority for the department for uh, for a long time and will continue into the future as well. However, our efforts to develop this program uh, were really uh, initiated or reinvigorated following the lightning, uh, the CZU lightning complex fire in 2020. Uh, and it was an effort for us to be able to um, look much more holistically at all of our parks and uh, oh. determine what projects were of high priority and that, uh, what were feasible for us to implement within the five-year timeframe for the program. Uh, so there are 32 projects that are identified in the fuel management program, um, and they are dispersed through a majority of our park sites and really distributed throughout the entire county, which you can see on the map in this slide. Uh, 20 of the projects in the program are considered new or previously untreated areas, and 12 are focused on maintenance of previous fuel reduction efforts. Uh, so a huge priority for our projects is this long-term maintenance aspect, uh, so that for any fuel reduction project we implement, we can focus on uh, ongoing maintenance efforts as well, so that these areas uh, won't regrow um, and we won't end up back at square one within a few years time. Um, maintenance work is also typically more cost effective. So once you complete that initial heavy lift of vegetation management, um, the maintenance efforts are usually um, more uh, uh, a lighter touch needed to keep, keep up the, the benefits of that work. Um, the five-year timeframe that we're looking at for the program is not meant to represent the end of our fuel reduction efforts. Um, we plan to keep up implementation and maintenance uh, for these projects into the long term, but the focus for this five year time frame is really uh, on this discrete project list um, and is a way for us to effectively monitor our project progress and be able to incorporate adaptive management um, efforts into our planning process and monitoring process as needed. Uh, so the purpose for um, really any fuel reduction project is to change the density or continuity of fuels and to replicate a form of natural ecosystem disturbance that would have historically occurred, uh, like a low intensity wildfire. Um, and that uh, would have naturally thinned out the forest historically. Um, and over the, the past hundred years, uh, fire suppression or passive management have resulted in forests that are much more dense um, and are lacking this type of regular natural disturbance. And while it took a long time for our forests to get to this condition, it'll also take a long time to change this. Uh, in areas where fuel reduction work has occurred, um, these efforts can help reduce or slow the spread of fire, uh, reduce the vertical and horizontal continuity of fuels, um, it can help keep a ground fire on the ground and provide strategic defensible space areas. It can also help preserve and uh, enhance critical access or evacuation routes. Uh, fuel reduction is not meant to completely stop or halt the spread of a fire, especially during periods of strong wind uh, when fire can be blown across these areas. Shaded fuel breaks are a common approach for fuel reduction. Um, and these can include removing smaller diameter understory trees, um, removing ladder fuels, and reducing understory vegetation density. Um, these are often preferred because they help maintain a, a, an existing level of vegetation cover, and they're mo more cost effective on a per acre basis to implement. Uh, fuel, uh, full fuel breaks um, may also be implemented, and this is uh, when the majority of a tree canopy or uh, existing vegetation cover is fully removed. Um, but these are often better over a smaller area uh, and where terrain is more favorable for equipment to be able to access um, and for personnel to be able to access in the event of a fire. Uh, through our fuel reduction efforts, we are working to be strategic about the placement of our fuel breaks or shaded fuel breaks. Um, and we're working hard to be able to provide a benefit to the greatest, um, uh, the greatest benefit possible to all uh, the entire community surrounding our parks. Uh, so out of the 32 projects that are in the fuel management program, uh, there are eight that have been underway so far um, uh, to date. And these include two large scale forest health and fuel reduction projects at Hutter and Wonderlick. 
Uh, there are two projects at uh, Quarry Park to maintain and expand shaded fuel breaks. And there have been four projects at San Bruno Mountain, JSP, and San Pedro Valley in order to manage and, and uh, remove other invasive species. In the graph, uh, what you can see is a uh, blue showing new treatment areas that were completed. Uh, so that's acreages completed in uh, 2021. Um, the yellow uh, represents areas uh, where maintenance work was performed. So acreages for maintenance work. Um, orange is uh, planned or upcoming work that is planned. Uh, and the gray is uh, future work in these park sites that um, will be at a later date as our planning efforts progress. Uh, to start with an update on our projects at Quarry Park in more detail, uh, as shown in the, the darker blue color on the map, uh, this is the project often referred to as the Governor's Fuel Reduction Project, which was implemented by CAL FIRE in 2019. Uh, and it's included in our program as a maintenance effort so that we can continue to upkeep the benefits of this fuel reduction project. Um, and so in, in 2021, we did a full sweep of the 83 acre area to uh, address invasive species regrowth, in particular broom that has been growing back in this area. Um, the areas on the map that are in green or teal shades uh, show a project to expand this network of shaded fuel breaks through the park and uh, in areas that were not completed through the governor's project. So of the total 119 acres for this, 100 will be worked on through a grant funded project with the San Mateo Resource Conservation District uh, that we uh, at County Parks have partnered with the RCD on um, and will focus on understory thinning and hazardous tree removals um, within 100 to 200 feet of the fire roads in the park. Uh, the orange is also a full fuel break proposed where trees within 200 feet of the park boundary on the southwestern side would be uh, removed as defensible space, but that is um, upcoming a bit further down the road. Uh, um, and then another project uh, to note that isn't shown specifically on this map is our uh, one of our capital improvement projects, the uh, South Ridge Fire Road, um, which would, if you can see my cursor, um, follow this ridge line and create a new critical access route for fire personnel to be able to access the park. Uh, so the images on this slide show examples of shaded fuel break work in Quarry Park. Uh, the top photos show what the understory vegetation density looks like uh, prior to work being completed, whereas the bottom photos show uh, after fuel reduction work has occurred, and the result is a really much more open understory, uh, much wider spacing between the remaining trees and reduced ladder fuels. And so uh, we feel this provides a really good um, illustration and visual for the difference in fuel load uh, between these photos. And if you could imagine, how differently a fire might behave um, in the before versus the after photos um, when you're considering what, uh, what type of available fuels there are. Um, and that in the after photos, this is greatly reduced. Uh, at Hutter and Wonderlick, also in partnership with the San Mateo Resource Conservation District, there are two landscape scale efforts to conduct a combined 402 acres of forest health and fuel reduction uh, at the two parks of which uh, there has actually been uh, just over 150 acres completed to date. Uh, the maps you see here show the various treatment areas where uh, the blue is work that has been completed uh, to date and the orange is uh, future treatments or upcoming treatment areas. Um, the big picture goals for these projects are not just to reduce fuel loads, but really to reintroduce a form of disturbance to these ecosystems, promote vegetation regeneration and succession, uh, address pathogens and invasive species, and make these forests more resilient to future disturbances like wildfire and climate change. Uh, these images uh, also show a representation of before and after work. Uh, and this is at Hutter Park, where uh, you can see the dead and, uh, or dying vegeta vegetation in the understory was masticated, um, which from a fuel reduction standpoint reduces the density of the fuels 
um, but also uh, sort of reduces the competition for resources like light or water or soil uh, nutrients and can promote the uh, regeneration or new growth of native species. Um, and again, these photos are a good representation of the, of the difference you can see in fuel load um, before and after the work is performed. Um, just to kind of highlight an area at Hutter Park as well, which isn't shown in um, these photos, but uh, the project, another governor's uh, fuel reduction project on Kings Mountain Road uh, that was completed in 2019 as well, is also a good example for the department to be able to see how this uh, type of forest or how the park responds to this type of work. And so our monitoring along Kings Mountain Road has really shown that native, the native vegetation there is growing back well. And then we have not been seeing an explosion or rapid spread of invasive species. Uh, at San Bruno Mountain, um, the first phase of a larger project to manage fuels occurred in uh, the fall of 2021. Uh, and so this first portion focused on removing some larger uh, eucalyptus trees along this park uh, access route and um, access corridor uh, that were either in declining health or had um, uh, some dead uh, limbs in the canopy. And this really helped reduce the canopy connectivity uh, in this, on this access route and provide better access for equipment when further uh, expansion of this project is planned. At San Bruno Mountain as well, um, there have been ongoing efforts to control an invasive shrub species called gorse, which grows in very dense patches in, um, within San Bruno Mountain. Um, and so we've been doing work to keep the species under control and uh, try and remove um, very dense stands of the species. Uh, at San Pedro Valley, um, there was work completed in 2021 as well in order to um, do some eucalyptus management uh, in a stand uh, adjacent to the neighborhoods in Pacifica, as well as in proximity to some of the in-park facilities. Uh, coming up in the rest of 2022, uh, there are going to be efforts to continue maintenance and uh, new treatments and all of those projects that I discussed, including close to 250 acres of more work at Hutter and Wonderlick and 100 acres of shaded fuel break expansion and hazardous tree removals at Quarry. Um, and there will also be expansion um, of our eucalyptus and gorse management efforts. Um, new projects uh, have that have been actively planned for um, include a shaded fuel break project at Edgewood County Park and uh, as well at Memorial County Park. Uh, and while I've spoken uh, a lot about the, the projects themselves that have been uh, implemented or that we will be working on, um, I'd also like to highlight that by having the wildfire fuel management program in place, uh, the department has been able to be more focused in how we implement the work and uh, assign resources for our projects and for how we can monitor our progress on implementation. And so because of this, we have been able to, to complete 211 acres of fuel reduction treatment in the past year with more to come. And by the end of the fiscal year, we're on target to have completed the most fuel reduction acreage than in any fiscal year prior to this. Um, it has also streamlined our process for applying for grant funding by having this predefined list of priority projects. Uh, it allows us to more quickly identify which of these projects may be competitive for a grant. Um, and a great example uh, is that the San Mateo Resource Conservation District was successful in getting over a million dollars in funding from the State Coastal Conservancy. Um, and there are five other grant applications uh, that are currently pending. Um, I also listed that uh, the a grant funding award to the RCD from CAL FIRE and the California Climate Investments Fund, um, which is the, the funding that's um, uh, going towards the implementation for Hutter and Wonderlick um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and while um, the wildfire risk reduction benefits of all of our projects are, um, are substantial, um, 
for all of the projects that we have going on as well as those that we plan for in the future. Um, we really want to promote and incorporate um, a variety of the different environmental and ecological benefits into the project plans. And so really the goal being that we can work with nature and not against it. And that uh, there's an acknowledgement that most native ecosystems in California are well adapted to this um, frequent or uh, natural disturbance cycle. Uh, and we want to incorporate these ecological principles um, like disturbance, regeneration, ecological succession into the projects, promote carbon sequestration, uh, improve habitat characteristics that are compatible with native wildlife, um, and uh, understand that while native vegetation is still susceptible to wildfires, uh, that the uh, native species, many are also very well adapted to survive or regrow after a fire. Um, on that vein, a project that's not currently uh, included um, as one of our uh, wildfire fuel management program uh, projects, um, but is something that the department is uh, in the planning efforts for is a climate and habitat resiliency plan for Pescadero Creek County Park. And this again is in response to the impacts uh, to the park from the CZU fire in 2020. And so this planning effort um, that builds on that uh, goal and intention of um, uh, forest management and forest restoration um, and improving habitat conditions for native species and native wildlife that use this park as habitat. Um, and so uh, our, um, our planning efforts to, to establish this plan are underway and we'll uh, be planning to share more with the commission uh, at a later date as we continue to, to uh, work towards this climate and habitat resiliency plan. And uh, with that, I'll open it for any questions and discussion. Great, and yeah, may, maybe we start, we start like we've been doing uh, with, with the commissioners, see if there's any, any discussion uh, points. I'll open up to you guys to, if you have any other, uh, any questions or comments or anything about what Hannah just presented. I have a question. Um, Hannah, you mentioned carbon sequestration. When you cut down these trees and chip them up, isn't all the carbon released? And uh, what, what do you, yeah, how do you deal with that? I and mean, what's the plan? Uh, so with um, mastication and, and chipping, we're actually not removing or releasing carbon yet. That will break down differently. Like the, you know, the chip material will um, break down and decompose um, into the soil, but that carbon doesn't um, essentially get released into the atmosphere. It still stays on site as like carbon in that ecosystem. But an aspect of carbon sequestration that um, is a, a benefit for these projects is actually um, by allowing um, or by re reducing the competition between trees within a forested ecosystem by doing some of this understory thinning and reducing competition for resources, it actually allows for uh, the retained trees to grow and uh, increase in biomass. So that is actually um, uh, an increase in carbon sequestration by um, allowing um, opportunities for uh, these retained trees to grow in size. Um, and so that is really well observed in species like um, coast redwood, um, who are, uh, you know, uh, trees that are very, um, you know, uh, carry a huge amount of above ground biomass. Um, but it, it's a, a concept that applies to really any type of um, vegetation just on varying scales in that um, by reducing competition for resources, those species that are left on the landscape can be more effective at carbon sequestration and biomass retention. Okay, great. Uh, through the chair, um, first of all, thank you for a very excellent report. You know, both uh, both the written one that uh, is in the packet and uh, you know the one that you presented. Um, but in your report, you identify that there are sixteen thousand acres uh, uh, covering the, all the thirty-two projects uh, that are part of this uh, wild, you know, wildfire fuel reduction program. And you also indicated that uh, 
removal of vegetation is extremely expensive uh, with a price difference of about 90, between 90,000 and 400,000 per acre. And so first of all, why, the, why such a large difference? Why, the, why such a large difference? And I say it depends on density, but you know, if you could add on to that, I would certainly appreciate it. Yeah, and then, absolutely. Sorry. And so, so since uh, twenty uh, since twenty twenty one, you started. Uh, we've started eight projects, and so uh, in terms of the amount of money we need for the entire sixteen thousand acres, uh, do you think it's going to be easy to access that money? I mean, you mentioned Measure K, and you also mentioned grants. Uh, you know that have been applied for, and you, you know, and, and and received. So, could you sort of give me a percentage? How much of Measure K is being utilized, percentage-wise, and how much are you anticipating? You know, you know, getting from, you know, from grants. And one I, last question in in terms of uh, the you know the 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 alien vegetation that you you wanna you wanna get rid of. Uh, what percentage of our system consists of alien vegetation? Um, so regarding the first question about cost per acre, um, it, uh, you hit on it, it is variable because of, um, it could depend on the vegetation type being removed. So depending on whether we're managing shrub species or, um, oak woodland habitat or, um, or eucalyptus uh, trees, there's uh, gonna be different level of effort required depending on the type of vegetation, the amount of material that needs to be removed. Uh, there are considerations around the approach, whether we're doing understory thinning or full removal of all vegetation. So that would um, you know, translate to a different level of effort. Um, uh, it can be related to the type of equipment that's needed to complete the work. So um, uh, if it's accessible by heavy equipment um, and you can bring in a, you know, a, a masticator or um, you know, a, a track chipper or some other heavy equipment to help process the vegetation versus having to go in and do handwork, um, there's gonna be differences in cost for labor and equipment. Um, and uh, the type of terrain um, and the, the type of access as possible also dictate the, co the, the cost and the level of effort for different projects. And so the range for implementation cost per acre can be quite large um, because of that. And so um, when we're estimating costs, we're trying to figure out you know, what, what is the objective? What are we trying to remove? Uh, what's the ac existing access like? What are we anticipating um, in terms of costs? And so it, it definitely is a wide range um, and can vary pretty significantly um, from project to project. Um, in terms of the funding uh, question, um, grants versus Measure K. Uh, so currently, um, uh, I, I guess I don't have an exact proportional percentage of grant versus measure K. Um, we have the, uh, the, two, the grant funding listed from the CAL FIRE and the, the State Coastal Conservancy grant funding, um, but from measure K funds uh, each fiscal year, um, we have 1.5 million available in measure K funding um, for fuel reduction for this fiscal year and for next. Uh, at this time, um, that is our, our, our Measure K funding availability, um, and we'll continue to pursue other grant opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, there are five different grant opportunities of different size that are currently, uh, that are currently pending award, um, and so we will be waiting to find out whether those are successful grant applications, and those will help go towards implementation for future projects. And we'll be able to continue to pursue other grant opportunities that come up as they arise um, and take advantage of that um, to help with our implementation costs. Uh, through the chair, one additional question. Is there, is there um, any effort, you know, to work with, uh, with cities, you know, uh, 
have, uh, you know, residential areas that are in close proximity, uh, you know, to our park so that, uh, you know, they, you know, for the sake of their, of their residents who would, would be willing, you know, to pay part of the cost of uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, their rev residents are not impacted by a fire should it occur. Yeah, uh, so I think, um, you know, there are a number of neighborhood defensible space uh, efforts. Um, uh, Sheena may be able to speak to some of the RCD's uh, assistance that they're able to provide in terms of neighborhood uh, programs. There are, um, uh, there's the Fire Safe Council um, and other um, uh, fire agencies that work on um, other projects within cities and city jurisdictions um, that do have complement um, uh, and intersect with a number of our parks projects. Um, I can uh, work to sh uh, share or provide some examples or other information at a future meeting if that's desired. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Great. All right. Just to keep it moving along, uh, Commissioner Manning, do you have you have any uh, any comments or questions uh, for for Hannah? Okay, um, I, I will hold my questions just to keep things going. But I, I will say I'm I'm really excited about all the uh, first of all all the all the funding that kind of kicked in kind of post the post the the CZU uh, fire, um, and I'm glad that there is a long term plan to be able to kind of deal with a lot of these uh, with with a lot of these potential problems uh, moving forward. So uh, yeah, uh, great great work on that. Um, I, I think uh, if if there's no other comments from the commissioners. Um, I will uh, open this up then for uh, for public comment. All right, let's double check real quick. Um, I do have, let me see, public comment. We do have three items or three, actually people raised their hand for this. My, my glasses are missing. So let's see, we do have uh, Len Erickson followed by Carol Ann Young followed by Pam Pollard. So um, give me one second while I'll go ahead and pull on my um, timer. Uh, all right, hold on, Mr. Exxon. I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up and share my screen. Okay, go ahead, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, can you hear go me? Ahead. Yes, go ahead. Okay, very good, thank you. So I wanna use this opportunity to, uh, to build on or piggyback my comments to uh, Nicholas's talk on the master plan and, and acknowledge that in uh, Quarry Park, uh, which is neighbors, uh, El Granada, where I live, we have an enormously large eucalyptus forest, uh, probably the largest in the state. And it really puts it out of range of many projects that fit within the kind of budget framework that you're describing for parks such as Hutter and Wonderluck, where you're doing really good things. And I feel there's, there's an opportunity here to, on the very big side, to approach the larger problem not to compete with what you're talking about, but to look at the five to 15 year framework and go out and look for support there. The Fire Safe Council had a Cal, UC Cal expert on eucalyptus who made a couple of points uh, relative to their uh, overall characteristic and also noting that with climate change, they, they may be fading or not no longer quite as uh, likely to grow here, but that's a long-term degradation. But I think relative to revegetation, We've had uh, our forester from Cal Fire speak to figures that are up above $100 million to do it. Nicholas's uh, document noted the same thing. So we're not trying to put it in the same framework as what you're doing there. But I think by, by looking on the big side, and I would point out that the mid coast has had this problem before. We needed a tunnel built at Devil's Slide and after years of lobbying, et cetera, at the state and federal level, it got built. And that's sort of the magnitude of the problem we have here. So I'd like to see us working collaboratively with parks to look at that type of framework for this very large problem. Thank you. Thank you. Janeth, uh, do we have other hands raised? I was muted and I was already, <laughs> my whole spiel was already, I'm like, what's going on? What's, why is no one speaking? 
Anyways, I think I think she'd put the unmute on me so you can <laughs> stick your spiel. Um, I, know, I just I I... Spiel. hold on one second. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and put your timer on. I know I was like okay. I was in a roll. My voice wasn't talking to me. Anyways, Nobody yeah, was talking. To us. <laughs> I didn't hear you call my name, but I did see the unmute button. Anyway, I just have <laughs> one really quick question for <laughs> Hannah. I definitely agree with what um, uh, Len Erickson said, uh, who, by the way, is on the uh, Mid Coast Community Council and lives in El Granada. But that is, uh, there are so many homeowners in El Granada that are losing their homeowners insurance or it's becoming so excessively high. So it's extremely important to keep working on the Quarry Park thing. But the one question I had for Hannah was when you showed those two slides slide, side by side, and even maybe Sina could, Sheena, sorry, could do this, answer it. What's the difference when you masticate something and just leave all the debris on the ground? Isn't that byproduct also flammable. Thank you. That's my only question. Thanks for your comment, Carla. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then we'll have, um, let me see. John Pollard. One second. Can you hear us? You know, you're trying to unmute me and I already yeah, I know, I know. I don't know what's going on. It's like it's not working for some reason. Last second. That, that was given to me. I don't need it. I know. It's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, I, I, sorry, I'm having I a glitch on this, on this whole Zoom thing. So hold on. Fran? Yes, hi, can you hear me okay. now? Go ahead, please. There we go. Yes. There you okay. go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, uh, I agree with the previous two speakers, Carlisle and Len Erickson. Um, we I'm, I'm hoping that you can do, um, advance the uh, removal of the trees around the, the community. Um, I know that's um, RCD's project. And Sheena, I was wondering, are you gonna give a, a presentation? Anyway, okay, well then do I wait till you speak or? <laughs> Cause that's, that's the thing that the, there's a lot of giant trees that hang over uh, all the homes around, around uh, the, the forest and um, I'm just worried in, in these great winds and um, they're gonna fall on our houses. They have to be cut, the ones right along the perimeter of the park that adjoins the community. Uh, I'm hoping you can uh, speed up the, the removal of the trees rather than wait another year. We did not, are not getting the rain that everybody else is getting today. Uh, it, our streets were damp. That was it. Uh, yeah. it. The rain keeps bypassing El Granada. I can't believe it. It's mm -hmm. happened almost every time this year, except for the one big storm we had back. When was that? The end of last year. It's been dry for the last two months, which are normally our wettest season. So things are drying up already. Um, and I'm really worried about fire and I'm worried about the wind and trees falling. I don't, I heard 40 trees fell in Quarry Park and I want to thank you for all you've done, mm -hmm. uh, Sheena and, and the trees got a couple of dead trees were cut this, um, week. Janet, did we lose the, the timer? Are we, are we up on time here? Yeah, we're done. Oh, yeah, that was, that was the, that was the bell. That was, okay. that was it. Yeah. Great, thank you, thank you, Fran, and and you'll have another opportunity uh, in eight point two uh, to provide co public comment if you as as needed. All right, um, any anyone else uh, on on eight point one before we move on to eight point two? That's it. I think that's all that we had. Yep. More. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so in line with a lot of the public comment that we just had, <laughs> we are going to go into a little bit more of a, of a deep Thanks. dive onto the El, El Granada wildfire resiliency uh, scoping project. So uh, hand it back over to, to Hannah and team to, to uh, get into that. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to introduce Shinetsi Du, who's our uh, Forest Health and Fire Resiliency pro pro Program Manager for the San Mateo Resource Conservation District. Um, and she is uh, joining us tonight to present on uh, an El Granada scoping, uh, wildfire hazard uh, scoping project for, um, for the community of El Granada. And we'll be able to provide an update to the commission on that project and some information on what that is working to accomplish. Okay, thanks Hannah. And thank you everybody um, for the invitation to speak um, today. Let me just get my screen share up. Okay, there we go. Um, and my presentation up squared away on both of my screens. Okay, thanks. thank you everybody um, for inviting me to speak today. Um, so as Hannah was saying, I am um, the Forest Health and Fire Resiliency Program Manager for the San Mateo RCD. Um, and we, um, I've been working with Hannah on many different projects, not just the scoping project. So um, this is a great opportunity to touch a little bit on all of those and then do a little bit of a deeper dive um, and share the scoping project, um, specifically the El Granada Wildfire Resiliency Scoping Project with all of you. Okay, um, so this is my first time speaking um, to the commissioners today, um, but I do believe that you've had some of my colleagues and our executive director speak before, but I think it's always nice to give an overview of what is the RCD to folks that this still might be a little new to or might need a little reminder. Um, so what is the RCD? The RCD is an independent um, special district in San Mateo County. And although we're not part of county government, we do have the county um, appoint our director. So we do have that link. Um, and it's not only that link, um, we work closely together. Uh, there are about 100 RCDs in California and thousands more nationwide. Um, ours was one of the first created in 1939. And um, we operate on a $70,000 approximately annual property base uh, tax base. Um, and why I bring that up is because Otherwise, all of our projects are grant funded. So we all we need, to, it's necessary for us to get internal, external funding um, to support all of our work. We are a non-regulatory um, agency. We only work where we're invited. So we don't have any, especially when we're talking about this in the space of fire and um, fire resiliency, we don't have any authority to, um, or regulatory, regular, regulatory um, authority to enforce anything. We only work where we're invited. Um, and what we do is we serve as a local hub for conservation across many things beyond just fire. Um, we help people help the land and all, all of our work is boots on the ground. I think one of the things that's very special about us is that we do have those close connections with the community. Um, to understand and respond to needs. So this image um, is just a, the rough boundary um, uh, of our district, of our special district, um, although we do work across the county. So our, our work is in several different focal areas. So this includes water, um, climate, wildlife, agriculture, and of course, forest health and fire resiliency. And our projects span um, this whole this whole breadth, and of course, there's always overlap in our work, especially when it comes to natural resources and managing um, our natural resources in the county. And we have a long history of working with the county, so it's not just county parks. We also have um, lots of projects that we do with DPW, Office of Sustainability, Department of Emergency Management, uh, also with county planning. Um, and this work, the work um, extends into a, a lot of different um, areas. Um, so some of this work in county parks has included our work um, working in partnership on Old Hall Road, um, multiple projects at Memorial Park, including the removal of a dam, um, extending 50 miles of salmon habitat through the park, restoring water quality, uh, water infrastructure. We also do water quality monitoring um, in partnership with the county. This has been linked um, to those pet waste and um, issues that you're working on um, and off the, the dog, off dog, off leash dog um, project. So this is all connected through all the work with our seeding. 
So specifically for our forest health and fire resiliency work, um, again, our work touches through the county. And so to hone in on what I specifically manage as the pro program manager for forest health and fire resiliency, this includes our neighborhood chipper program. Um, I bring that up um, just to share that this is again, another partnership with the county and our, our fo uh, fire safe council, fire agencies to provide community level um, vegetation management. Um, this has been particularly valuable for a community like El Granada, um, where they are located at that wildland urban interface. And so we're able to do a cost share where um, res uh, residents and landowners are, um, are responsible for collecting the vegetation, but all they have to do is pile it up at the end of their driveway. And then we send out a chipper crew to um, chip that, that vegetation for free on a, a designated chipper event day. So the one that's gonna be coming up is in May in El Granada. Um, we've also helped the county with post-fire recovery efforts, um, general vegetation management. Um, another one that's really exciting, which is kind of like, not many people get excited about permitting, but I actually, I actually do. And that's, we've been doing a lot of work streamlining per permitting. Um, oh, I'm sorry, excuse my typo. Um, I think I just copied that here. So streamlining permitting. Um, and so one of the efforts that we've done is, um, without going too much into detail, detail, is a public works plan, which is this umbrella way to streamline permitting, especially with projects in the coastal zone. Um, and this is a way that we have been working with the Coastal Commission to um, work with them to streamline these projects, especially with forest health and fire resiliency, instead of um, request, uh, requiring a, a separate coastal development permit for any project in the coastal zone, it can fall under this umbrella um, uh, public works plan. And um, although we haven't um, used it on county parks land yet, um, this is something that Hannah and I have discussed that we do foresee this will be valuable in the future for future projects as a way that, that we can streamline that streamline those efforts and we can get more work accomplished in the coastal zone, which in the past has been a little bit of a barrier. I'm in a little bit of a bottleneck. Um, we're doing community wild, um, wildfire resiliency, which is the El Granada scoping project that I'll be talking about in just a moment. And then I just wanted to briefly touch on the forest health work we're doing together, Hannah. Um, thank you for sharing um, about that already in your presentation. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about it. I'm pretty proud of it. So I just wanted to share a few pictures of, about that. Um, so we're doing actually 1,500 acres of forest health work across San Mateo County. And what this is doing is it's providing a landscape level benefit across the county. So before we, if we're, before previous work is most like more smaller scale work, very important, um, focusing on um, you know roadways, vegetation management. But now we can look at this work at that landscape level. And in fact, we're actually partnering with our RCD, um, counterpart RCD in Santa Cruz County, and they're also doing a set of similar forest health work. And you can actually see this landscape level benefit across the whole Santa Cruz mountain area uh, that is going to provide some better resiliency and better forest health and all those multiple ecosystem benefits that Hannah touched on. And that's going to be across our whole region. So again, the work that we're doing in county parks is, is huge itself, 400 acres, but that is part of even a bigger piece and better resiliency we're, we're developing. So this is just a before and after um, picture that I wanted to show. This is at Wonderlic. Um, and I like to show this because um, Hannah already showed some pictures too, but um, I think some folks, when we were first talking about the forest health projects, they were worried about it being like just major like clear cutting or like just a complete removal of vegetation. And I like to show this picture because here we like flagged some um, manzanita. There was some dead um, vegetation and it gets removed. And again, it, 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 it actually, this, as Hannah was saying, um, require the system does require uh, the occasional disturbance and this is going to be reviving the forest and making it healthier and i'll just flip through two other pictures because again they're great um this is before and at, another before and after at wonder like um and then this is in a, a chaparral um, scrub area too so again we're really working to um, maintain the integrity of the um the complex ecosystem and helping to revegetate um, healthier vegetation and reducing fuel loads and making things a forest health vegetation healthier. So there's again multiple benefits. Okay, so now um, with that introduction, um, I'll just dive into the El Granada Wildfire Resiliency Scoping Project. 
So uh, this project is funded through Measure K funds. Um, the county contributed $75,000, which is going directly towards the consultants that are helping us in this project. Um, the county also supports RCD staff with basic project development. That is how we're able to respond to community needs immediately as they're emerging. So that's funding some of the staff time that we're serving as project managers for this project. And the rest of the $75,000 is going directly to the consultants um, to produce this, um, this scoping project um, work. So the purpose of the um, project is to develop a site-specific understanding of wildfire scenarios for El Granada and the surrounding community and scope a suite of actions that would most effectively reduce those risks. So the way that this project got uh, was brought up is that um, there was we were hearing a lot of things from the community about what they wanted to do to reduce um, wildfire risk. Um, and there was also this, this um, issue that came up where the county did help to um, remove some eucalyptus trees along the medians inside of the community as well. But there was some question is that um, what is actually the most effective thing we can do? Um, as we're learning from the public comments that are coming up, there's a lot of things that could be done. There's feel, there is a lot of concern and needs that the community has to reduce wildfire risk, but where can we get the best bang for our buck in investing in reducing risk for the community? Is it in Quarry Park? Is it a little bit in Quarry Park and a little bit inside of the community? Should we potentially focus mostly on home hardening? Like there could be, a million different things that we could do, but let's use this study to figure out what could be the most effective. And that's, and then oh, I'll go into the suite of actions in a moment. So let's, let's leave it at that. Um, so just a quick picture of um, where we're, we're working. You all know where El Granada is, um, but I pulled this map, particular map up um, because um, the, this is actually the Cal Fire Fire Hazard Severity Zone map where red is very high. And so that's where we are. The community is directly adjacent to the very high um, area. Quarry Park is right there. Um, and so there is there is just based on this information alone, it's clear that there is um, a need um, to take a closer look at this. Um, oh, I'm sorry that the quality is a little poor on this. I don't know how it's showing up here, but I think you, I think as you are all familiar with um, El Granada, this should be okay. So here, here's Quarry Park, and um, the focal area of our project is the whole community of El Granada, which includes Quarry Park, and then we are also um, expanding out three miles um, from here. And so our whole assessment of fire risk is within this three mile zone around the community. And so what we're doing is um, when we're doing risk assessment, um, we're going to be collecting, um, well, we've already done this phase, is, is collect data about um, what we can use to model the fire risk assessment for the community. So we're, previously I was showing you this map, which is the um, wild, uh, the fire hazard severity zone map. And that's a very coarse level. This is done, this mapping from CAL FIRE is done for the whole state at a coarse level, identifying where there's high, very high, high and moderate um, fire zone risk. And then what many communities across the, across the state are doing is they're actually um, honing in and act, looking at it at more fine scale level about the exact severity. Like this map is not gonna show you exactly where particular um, risks are in the community, right? Again, this is a course level. So what we're doing is um, we're using um, we're using basis of this type of mapping. We're using the fine scale mapping that the county has funded to the fine scale vegetation mapping the county has funded. We're using information about wind patterns, about topography. We're also looking at where assets are in the community um, in a, a several different variables. We're also listening to um, the needs and the um, contextual narratives of the community where they're also sensing some concerns as well. And so again, we're looking at this map, we're, we're going to be doing this fine scale, um, detailed uh, modeling of where there's fire risk. And so this is going to include the 300 plus acres of uh, the eucalyptus in Quarry Park and all of Quarry Park, but also concerning the count, the community inside where there's also 100 acres plus of um, eucalyptus inside and just any additional potential um, risks. And so 
And this overview is first part we're going to do is we're going to define the wildfire risk to El Granada and effective com communities, including an overview of fire ecology, local fire history, fire environment, which includes fuel characteristics, fuel models, weather topography. Then we're going to assess the wildfire risk to El Granada and the affected communities, including most likely scenarios, ignition probability, fire behavior, potential fire spread, and general identification of values at risk. And then we're going to identify and scope any, an array of potential actions that would most effectively reduce those risks and build wildfire resiliency. And I'm using the word actions on purpose instead of potentially projects. You might've expected, I might've used the word projects, but actions, uh, we wanted to do it more broadly, right? So actions can include, um, maybe there's some policy changes that could be in effect. Um, one thing, for example, we've done last year working with the county is to help work on a tree exemption um, for permitting so that folks could remove trees that are of a higher fire risk um, without using, uh, without needing to get a tree permit. And so that was like an, that was an action that could be done instead of like, a, it was not a particular like, pro, like a vegetation management pro project. And so again, we wanted to identify a scope of a suite of potential actions that could be taken to reduce wildfire risk. Um, and then we're not doing this alone. So one of the reasons I'm invited to speak with you today is that you, you as County Parks are one of our project partners in the project team. So RCD is the project manager. We've hired consultants, which are Panorama, Vibrant Planet, and Prometheus Fire to do the modeling, the, this, developing the suite of actions and on the ground truthing. And then our partner team includes Supervisor Horsley's office, County Parks, Coastside Fire Protection District, County Fire, Cal Fire, Mid Coast Community Council, um, as an RCCD um, Associate Director and a community at large member. So this is a core team that's meeting regularly um, to discuss the pro process um, look at data together. Um, we'll be reviewing the suite of actions that are developed and the fire assessment. And this is just a brief timeline. Um, our data collection was um, completed in January. Right now, um, February, March, there's the risk assessment and developing the recommendations. Um, the final project report is expected at the end of April. And then we will be having a public presentation in May. And so this is a quite a quick uh, turnaround. Um, and I'm really excited because I will, it will be relatively quick. So I know that folks are very anxious and wanting to know um, the, what actions can be done and what's like the empirical evidence of what are the best actions, again, the best bang for our buck for projects. And so I'll just conclude with this, that the project is contributing to a more fire resilient mid, resilient mid coast. And so the scoping project is just one of multiple efforts by many agencies and organizations to increase wildfire resiliency in the mid coast region, right? So this is in, this is on top of the projects RCD is doing with county parks to uh, for our uh, our fuel break along the fire roads, for example, um, the med the eucalyptus and the medians were removed, the tree exemption. There's um, Coastside Fire Protection District is also doing a lot of vegetation management. The fire marshal has also invoked some pro programs. Like there's a lot of things happening. So this is just one of many. Um, the project connects to the existing quarry parks fuel reduction projects. And then just to be clear, this is a planning project only. Um, and one of the best things it does is it sets us up for future funding. So we're going to be able to identify those projects that again, the biggest bang for our buck, and then we can, uh, we can match that up to what's the best funding. We are not prioritizing the projects. What we're going to do is we're going to match what's the best project. So if something comes up that there's home hardening funds out there and, it, and home hardening has been identified as a, as a good project to help build fire resiliency, we'll match those opportunities up and put that project forth. If there's a project that looks at invasive species removal and is, is providing a lot of funding for invasive species, we'll match that up with any potential eucalyptus removal projects. And we'll just match up the funding. We're not gonna prioritize it. We'll just know what are the best projects that are gonna be outlined. And then we can put those forth. And then um, earlier today, we were talking a little bit about like, how, how does funding look? Um, Right now, I mean, we're all excited about um, building more fire resilient communities. The state is also very excited about this and um, funding is flowing down quite fast. And sometimes we don't even know what, they, what 
programs are coming up. There's some programs that are annual, but there, I've also in the past uh, year and a half come across projects that programs that are just like arising because state funding is flowing down. For example, the, the $1.1 million we have for the fire road um, uh, uh, project in Quarry Park um, with the fuel reduction in, uh, along the fire roads, that was from a project that the Coastal Conservancy just had a pool of money and they gave us two weeks to write the proposal. We wrote it and received the funding. And it was just one of these immediate things that we had a project, we could link it up and we could just pounce on it instead of like starting from square one. And then I just want to emphasize that there's no obligation from this. This is a planning project. We are going to identify the key projects, but no one is going to be required to do this. Again, there's no authority behind it, but this is the best thing that we can do to serve the community is to develop a good, concise plan with our partners. Um, and I'll end on a really high note is one of the things that I've been finding very rewarding about this process. Not only are we actually doing some things to advance fire resiliency, we have a very strong um, partnership growing amongst all the partners. Um, it, this has been giving us a great opportunity to increase communication with our partners, with the fire agencies, um, again, with county parks, although I feel like our partnership is strong to begin with, um, but with also the, with the fire agencies, also with MCC, engaging more with the community to, to, to provide something that's um, really tangible and a tangible outcome. So um, I'll end with that. Um, I can answer questions and I can also be, uh, we can be reached by email if anybody has any follow-up questions. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, and before we get into, into public comment, I wanted to see if any of the commissioners had any uh, questions or, or other stuff for uh, first unit before we move on. Yeah, nothing. Mm. Any of the commissioners or should we move on to yeah, public yeah, comment? I have, I have, oh. I have a question uh, really quick. Um, you talked about the, um, the three mile radius. Mm -hmm. So that would be, you're gonna be looking like in Montera and, and uh, places that are, are that far away from El Granada as part of this project? Yes, we are including that in the data because it, it makes sense. Like um, if a fire was gonna be beyond the borders of El Granada, we want to know about that. So for example, we reached out to GGNRA and they've done some vegetation management projects on their property um, and they've provided us that data. So that's gonna be included in the model. And that will be included in, in perhaps your, um, your permitting um, program where, you, where you'd, get, you'd make permitting easier or um, 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 for the permitting, that's for any projects that maybe arise from this project or other ones. Um, we can team up and make permitting, okay. um, streamline Perfect. permitting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Great. Um, any other comments or questions from the commissioners before we hand it over to public comment? All right, let's open it up. Janet, you still with us? Of, yes, of course. Uh, let's see, I don't have anybody. Um, probably call, let's just let me double check. Uh, I do actually. Just kidding, I do. I actually have uh, Van Pollard followed by Lynn Erickson, followed by Carol Ann Young. So let me just go ahead and call on uh, Van Pollard first before I put my um, little timer on over here. One second. I know my thing is my my my, my timer is kind of giving me a hard time today, so uh, bear with me. Um, that's my only thing. That's, that's kind of like um, let me see. So fan portal first. Let me see. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Fan? Can you hear me? me? Yes, I can. My, my, okay, I'm, I have my, uh, my timer for the side, so just go ahead and just kind of talk, and I'll just let you know when your tone time is up. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, um, all right, I'm Fran Pollard. I live in El Granada, right across the street from Quarry Park, uh, which I didn't say before. <laughs> so <laughs> I want, as I was saying, uh, I wanted to thank County Parks. They've been, they were cutting the trees in the park this week, and um, got, got rid of a couple of dead trees in, in the park. And, but again, 
Uh, and Sheena, I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing on this and being so good about about the whole situation. And I hate to see it stop in May when you said you're going to do a presentation. I'm hoping that after the presentation, you start doing um, removing some of the trees, as I started to say before, around the perimeter where all the homes are adjacent to the park, all around the park and um, those need to be cut before they either fall on the homes and, and the PG&E wires are right under all these trees um, uh, along our driveways. I don't know how we're gonna get out. And as I said before, I think we're one of the most densely populated areas in the county. That's why I think it's an emergency situation that has to be done this year, not wait another year to start removing trees. We only have one way out. It's Highway 1, and I can just see it bottleneck. Everybody, 7,000 people trying to get out on Highway 1, either go north or south, and, and we're stuck. Something has to be done, and I agree. It's very, I think it's an emergency situation and has to be done, and as soon as you can, I'd, we'd all appreciate it. Thank you so much, and thanks a lot, Sheena. And thanks, County Parks, for cutting. Thank you. Janet, who's next? Sorry, I'm on mute and I'm like talking away. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Uh, let's see. Next one we have is. Sorry. Um, That from Pollard? Sorry. Hold on one second. Okay, we'll have on Len Erickson. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Len. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, not, not surprisingly, following up on the same mm -hmm. pattern for the previous speakers, Mm -hmm. I'm emphasizing that uh, here in El Granada, bordering on Quarry Park, we have the largest concentration of eucalyptus. And just as a measure of it, I talked about the uh, sort of estimates Cal Fire gave, which were in excess of $100 million if we wanted to take them all out at once. But at the same time, Cal, <clears throat> Cal Fire also pointed out you can't do that. This is a 10 or 20 year project, even if you wanted to get them all out, which, which we may well do. But to move forward, I think we have to sort of go at a magnitude that's above the levels that she is talking about, uh, which is just to recognize it's different in scale. So I'm looking to bring that forward to my MCC team tomorrow morning. And we'll have two meetings next week. The MCC will meet as well as the Fire Safe Council just to alert people. But I'm, I'm looking for support both from parks and RCD that it's, it's a different level. We have to have the good work that both parks and RCD do to justify it. Uh, but if you want to take on the larger picture as well, that's measured, takes a long time and we recognize that. So I consider just the beginning of that effort as well. And I'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. Okay, so next, I think, and this, that was it. I, that's, I didn't call on um, Carol Ann Young. Hold on just one second. Oh, what time? Go ahead, Carol. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I had to wait for the mute button to appear. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, unmute, I mean. Um, thank you, Sheena. I go really ahead. appreciate everything that you've done. And of course, County Parks as well. Um, I was on a fire board meeting, oh, just somewhat recently. And they said that they're only going to be trimming back the X, getting out of... I guess ingress and egress to the coast is limited to Highway 1 North after the tunnel through Pacifica and the other way out is 92. For some reason, they're only trimming 92. And I wondered if you have been approached to tackle that eucalyptus grove that's right there on um, past the Lantos Tunnel as you come down the hill into Pacifica because... Um, I've mentioned it many times, we're, we're going to be trapped. It's a choke point on Highway 1, and we really don't have any way out. But um, if you have had anybody talk about it, apparently um, 
remember his name. John Co- Jonathan Cox, Fire Chief Cox, doesn't think they're going to do anything there. So, but I do appreciate all the work you have done, especially for the people in Quarry Park uh, area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, that's all set. Um, Chair. Okay. Yep. With that, uh, uh, we're already five fifty-five, but we're on we're on to the last uh, the last item on our regular agenda, uh, which is actually uh, the eight point three, which is preparation for the upcoming Parks Commission retreat. Um, so, as we discussed uh, in our last meeting in in January, uh, we've we've been trying to finalize timing logistics for an upcoming retreat uh, to start to pull together some of the subcommittees and the work plan for the coming year. Um, I believe we're still, and, and uh, Director Calderon, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, we're still planning to schedule a special meeting to not interfere with some of the other updates and the board work during our monthly meetings. Um, so at, at this time, maybe I'll, I'll just hand it off to Nicholas and to uh, Hannah to talk a little bit about some of the updates since the last time uh, we, we met and then uh, follow up with hopefully a quick discussion uh, about any kind of additional uh, agenda items or other things uh, from the commissioners as well as some public comment. Uh, so, so Nicholas and Hannah, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about where, where we are right now with, uh, with the retreat. Yeah, Chair Lugan, I'll turn it over to Hannah and let, uh, you know, Hannah's been working on the details, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have Hannah uh, brief everyone. Yeah, uh, so we were able to meet uh, with a, a facilitator who would be able to work with us for the commission retreat and um, wanted to pass along the availability they have for, uh, for setting a meeting um, and um, hopefully uh, be able to work with the commission on selecting one of the, the dates for available times. Uh, so the facilitator is available on uh, Monday, March 28th, Tuesday, March 29th, or Wednesday, March 30th, um, between four to seven. Okay. Great, and then in terms of the agenda, and we'll, we'll we'll discuss it in a moment, but just to just to get all the updates. So in terms of the agenda, I know you had sent out uh, an update uh, to I, I believe it was to all the all the commissioners in terms of, and I think it's part of the packet as well uh, in terms of the in terms of the the agenda. I know there were a couple of changes since we last talked. Um, I know we were at at the last at the last meeting talking about maybe a a, a Brown Act refresher. I think actually the the uh, the board and commission training that we had earlier today actually had had one in there. So, uh, or, or were, the, were there any other notable kind of changes in the in the agenda since we last met? Yes, definitely. So we did um, scale back the portion of the original proposal, which would include some of the um, items that were covered in the boards and commissions training that was held earlier today. Um, I, I do think uh, an overview. Um, uh, you know, a sort of a, a summary of some of those items for the agenda for the retreat may be a benefit, but it can be, um, a, you know, a briefer component of the agenda. Another change that we proposed is that the uh, time frame for which we're looking at for setting the priorities and the work plan would span through to the end of uh, fiscal year 2022-23, so that would go through June of 2023 so that we do get a bit of a longer outlook um, beyond just the calendar year of 2022. And that would line up with uh, the department's existing work plans and priorities um, that we're able to uh, project out towards and um, uh, understand when we'd be able to, to uh, bring items forward to the commission. Great, excellent. Um, and any other updates before we start getting into and setting up the, the discussion uh, with uh, the commissioners? Anything of note? I don't think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. All right. So um, ho hopefully for, for the commissioners, you guys had a chance to take a look at the revised uh, the, the revised uh, proposal for uh, the, the retreat, the agenda. Um, but I, I guess a couple things. So one, 
Um, and and I, I, I think in terms of the, the actual dates themselves, um, if uh, we have any like issues up front, I think let's, let's talk about that kind of, and this is towards the end of the month, 28th, 29th and 30th. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm fine either discussing it now or if uh, Hannah and or Nicholas can send out like a, a, a survey to, to kind of talk about which, which date works best. But if there's some no fly zones here, at least uh, with the commissioners that are present, uh, let's, let's chat about that and then also if you guys have any um i guess substantive kind of additions uh or questions about the agenda as it is right now um i think now might be the time to to do it i know we're we're a little bit late in the uh in in the in the agenda right now but i would love to at least take a couple moments so maybe uh if if any of the commissioners have some thoughts around uh around uh, either updates, changes. I know we actually spent time and, and I, I kind of went offline with, uh, with, with, uh, with Tanya uh, on, on this earlier uh, in the, in the, the, the session that, that we had. Uh, Tanya, who does some of this stuff for some of the other uh, commissions, she, she had set some retreats in the past. Um, so I, I, I have like one, one or two questions, but um, let's, let's start with the other commissioners in terms of any, uh, any questions or um, uh, updates or, or additions uh, uh, for the, uh, the agenda as it stands right now. Uh, through the chair, again, this comes out from the training that we received yeah. this morning. You know, for the first time, I learned that uh, we're supposed to have a staff board liaison. So the question is, who is that? And we're also supposed to have a specific board member uh, who is going to be the board member liaison. And so those two items bring up what relationship should the commission have with the, uh, 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 with, the, with the Office of the Board of Supervisors? And so I think that sort of needs to be included in our discussion, because currently, yeah, we know they're supposed, they're supposed to be one, you know, but we, are, we know we, we, don't, we currently don't have a board staff, a staff board liaison designated. That's, so, that's actually I, a fantastic point. That, that was one thing that was ringing in my head. And I know you were trying to ask that question in the training, but I do yeah. think that we should make sure that it's clear as well as the roles, right? Because they, they, right. they had outlined a couple of roles for those two particular, uh, for those two particular positions. But yeah, I, th I think that might, be, that might be a good one to add into the agenda. Yes. Great. Um, Commissioner Merrilees, Commissioner Mana, any any other uh, questions that you had about the the agenda or any things that we should be adding or or getting rid of as part of our uh, retreat coming up? No, I, I think I think there's a lot on the agenda. I don't think we're going to get to all of it, so we could pick any one of those and and talk for the whole time. Um, so I, I get I guess I'd encourage everybody to think about it and see if we want to pare it down when we when we get there, um, and pick the pick our priorities that we can go over first. Yeah, definitely an ambitious agenda, but you know, a lot, a lot to get to. So yeah, I, 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 I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. Great. Um, any other comments, uh, Commissioner so Mana? On, on the proposed date oh. through the chair, through the chair on the proposed yes. date, is there any, re could we have this on a Thursday? Because Thursday seems to be, you know, we meet on the first Thursday. We can we can have this retreat on the second Thursday, a third Thursday, a fourth Thursday. I think it'll be good. So if, if that's at all possible, if it's not if it's not possible, then I, I can understand that. Then we can choose between the three days because okay. I I mean the three days because I know on Wednesday I definitely would not be available at all. Okay. In those times, so the 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 other two days I may be able to work something out, okay. but Thursday would have worked perfectly on a non-commission meeting day. Okay. And then and then Nick, Nicholas and Han, is, is that something that we can kind of go back and see? Because yeah, I mean, I, I made I made Thursday work for uh, for for this tr for this board training. Granted, it was a it was a commission uh, meeting day, but um, are are there any other dates, or is that kind of uh, it it as it relates to the facilitator this month? Um, so, uh, oh, go go for it, Hannah. 
uh, that was the availability that the facilitator was able to offer um, within the month of March. They were not available on the 31st of March, which would be the Thursday of that month, and they weren't available on the uh, 24th, which would have been the, the Thursday prior. Um, so those were the dates we were able to work with and um, based off of their availability at this time. Got it. And so there is, I, I think there's one more Thursday or no, that's no, that's the 31st, right? Because our, our next mm -hmm. meeting would be on the 7th. Okay. Yeah. And I, I guess, I mean, I would much rather uh, if we can, and if, if it, if it works for everyone, um, get get it in prior to our next uh, our next scheduled meeting if we if we can if we can pull it because you know we're we're already a couple months into uh to uh 2022 um so i yeah i mean i i think maybe monday or tuesday um if if uh if the facilitator has absolutely is not able to do the 31st or 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 the thursday before maybe maybe we try to keep it to those two unless you know the the other commissioners have issues with that monday or tuesday or can't fully can't make it okay so i, I would agree with that through the chair i would agree with that so either march, march the 28th okay. or march the 29th so either one of those dates uh, would work for me okay. or i would make it work fantastic appreciate that how about how about the other commissioners you got you guys think those those two dates would uh would, would could could potentially work i need i need to look um, okay yeah uh, yeah okay. we can email all right. Yeah. So maybe let's let's have let's have a uh, hand if you're if you're taking it on uh, just a follow up with those two dates and and just try to get uh, get consensus on this. Um, I do I do uh, feel like we we need to kind of get this thing uh, rocking and rolling here uh, uh, sooner rather than later. So yeah, I think if we can if we can get it before the end of March, that would be that would be awesome. Um, great. Um, any other. Uh, comments or questions from the commissioners uh, on uh, on potential uh, topics or other things. I, I took down uh, uh, Commissioner Akello's uh, uh, question about like the, the liaisons and the roles and that kind of stuff. I think that that's definitely a good a good ad given the training that we had uh, this this morning. Uh, and any other things before we uh, before we open it up to public comment? All right, good. So let's uh, let's let's open it up for public comment and see if uh, see if there's any any things that folks uh, folks want to bring up. Janice. 